Hello, my name is Sam. And I'm Tonks. And that's Jay in the corner, so this must be Celluloid Scrutiny, the movie podcast where we take a classic movie and look at it through the eyes of a modern viewer. Except for when we don't. Today's movie is Monty Python's Life of Brian. Um, it was written by the Monty Python team. That's John Cleese, Terry's Jones and Gilliam, Eric Idle and Michael Palin. And it was directed by Terry Jones, who also directed Jabberwocky and Eric the Viking. Full disclosure, uh, this is actually the second time we've discussed this, this movie, because through a combination of errors on all three of our parts, last time it didn't actually record properly, so... We forgot to turn one of the microphones on, you know, that high-level stuff here. Anyway, back to the movie. Life of Brian was released in 1979. It was made for a budget of $4 million, and it made $20 million at the box office, so it didn't do too badly. The funding originally was going to be provided by EMI, but they were a little bit concerned about some of the content of the film, so they pulled out, and the rest of the funding was provided by George Harrison. Of the Beatles, George Harrison. Yes, Mr. George of the, of the Beatles, Harrison. He actually set up uh, his own film company, uh, Handmade Films, just so that he could make this movie, because uh, he wanted to make a movie that he felt he would want to go see himself. EMI, it turns out, were not quite off with that idea that it might be a bit controversial. The film was actually banned in Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, Ireland, and Norway. In fact, as soon as it was banned in Norway, Sweden started promoting it as the film so funny it was banned in Norway. It was also banned in certain local councils in the UK. Uh, in fact, Bournemouth had its first ever showing relatively recently uh, in 2015. It's like almost 40 years after the dang thing came out. About 35, I think it was, yes. In places where it wasn't banned, it was picketed by Christian and Jewish groups uh, who level charges of blasphemy, anti-Semitism, and making light of Jesus' suffering. Either. This all culminated in a rather interesting debate on uh, the BBC, on a programme called Friday Night, Saturday Morning, John Cleese and Michael Palin versus Malcolm Muggeridge and Mervyn Stockwood. Mervyn Stockwood being the Bishop of Southwark at the time. Really great names. They're, they're wonderful names, aren't they? Muggeridge. Southwark. I mean, uh, Stockwood. Mervyn. Yes, as I say, it was a rather interesting debate. Certainly worth watching. We'll pop the uh, link in the description. So, what was Life of Brian about? Life of Brian is about a person called Brian, strangely enough. He is the average, not very rich type person who's hanging around in first century Judea, sort of on the edges of what Jesus was up to yeah. with his, his gang, his notorious gang, the Pharisees. The notorious Pharisees. I think I've heard of them. So it's about Brian on the edges of the Jesus story. Yeah, and it's kind of telling that sort of story through the eyes of somebody who is you know, not the son of God, but is just a regular Joe or Brian, as it were. And you know, he, he gets he gets caught up in like the political and religious turmoil of, of the day, and he, he lives happily ever after at the end. Yeah, sure, we'll 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 go with that. Yes, he's not the son of God. He's a very naughty boy. Well, I was going to say he is the son of Naughtius Maximus, but okay, we'll take that. It's less that he's not the son of God, he's a very naughty boy. It's he's not the son of God, he's Naughty's boy. He's... <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Which I'm hilarious. I'm only asking this for the uh, benefit of the audience, because I watched your face while you were watching the movie. So tell me, what were your first impressions? Not great. Yeah... I'd never seen the movie before, and I can honestly say that my life had not been missing anything up until that point. And I'm pretty sure I'd categorise my feelings about this movie as I hated it. Ouch. There goes half our audience. Please direct any hate mail to celluloidscrutiny at gmail.com, <laughs> where it will be ignored. We'll give it the uh, custom artisan treatment as we put it into the spam folder. I am not a Python fan generally, and... Life of Brian really hasn't changed my mind, which is kind of almost a shame that I hated it because I've grown up with people who, who like it and so many people quoting it left, right and centre, and it almost feels like I've missed out on something and the, the, the fact that what I've seen of it 
it, you know, what I'd seen of it prior, I didn't like. And I was like, oh yeah, Life of Brian is meant to be their, their best movie and it's one, one of the best things they did. And I sat and watched it going into it thinking, okay, maybe this will be the one that changes my mind. And it, it really didn't. It just kind of cemented Monty Python as the kind of comedy that is not for me. I mean, that's a real shame, because Monty Python, obviously uh, influential, not just in comedy, uh, but in forming the sense of humour almost of a generation. I mean, without Monty Python, we wouldn't have had the likes of uh, the alternative comedians of the 80s, for example. Uh, you know, Stephen Fry's, your Hugh Laurie's, you know, we wouldn't have... No, you're giving me that look that says, good, good riddance. No. <laughs> Stephen Fry can get knotted as well. Hugh Laurie can stay. Again, any hate mail, please send to celluloidscrutiny at gmail.com. Make sure you write Tonks in the subject line, please. I'm not going to deny that the Python crew were hugely influential, and this this would have been one of the things that cemented them. But mm. And I'm glad for all of the comedians and the writers that they've influenced, but I... Re- I... What didn't you get, for lack of a better word? What didn't you get about it? It wasn't funny. I went into this assuming that a film by a comedy troupe was gonna be funny, and I think this movie pulled, like, two laughs out of me, and they were both for silly throwaway things. None of the big set pieces got a a reaction that was anything other than frowning, to be honest. I think uh, you got a giggle out of the uh, John Cleese uh, centurion, stupid person. <laughs> Silly person, yeah. Silly that, person. that made me giggle. And whoever it was who was doing the cockadoodle do part way through. Probably Terry Jones. That's not to say there weren't bits that I didn't like in the movie. I did enjoy towards the end as Brian starts getting caught up in all the religious fervour. Yeah. When they're sat arguing over the good or the, or the sandal or whether it's a shoe. I wrote down in my notes, it's like, this is how wars start. And split, you know, with the splitting of religious factions and over relatively small things and the way it was poking fun at that. But it still didn't pull a laugh out of me. And that's a shame, really. I mean, personally, I, I still find it very funny. Uh, there were a couple of scenes that had me cringing because I and my tastes have come a long way since the last time I saw it. But I still thoroughly enjoyed it. Jay is waving a placard at me at the moment, uh, telling me that in fact it was one of their favourite movies, uh, but after watching it uh, with us this time, they hate it too now. So, sorry. (laughs) The the thing is, it's like the things that you were cringing at, the things that tipped the movie over from just being kind of boring and meh into like me outright hating it and the things that have put Jay off they're all the same things it's it's like this shopping list of non-politically correct things that they're doing and that's what people would call it but I tend to frame that as being an asshole and it starts right at the beginning you've got one of the pythons in brown face in the first five minutes yeah and I saw that and I thought please let that be the only instance of this kind of (laughs) And if it had been, it would just have been, you know, a comedy movie that the humour was not for me. But it doubled down and then tripled down on on that kind of humour. What uh, What with? I I guess the brown face wasn't meant to be funny in itself. That's just putting one of the pythons in brown face because they couldn't be asked to hire a a non-white actor. Our usual game of where are the black people? You've set a film in first century uh, Middle East and that everybody looks white. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, Jesus Christ Superstar came out before that, and that cast a black man as Judas, and was very interesting, you know, to, to watch. But yeah, it kind of it went straight from you know having one of the pythons in brown face to a really long scene that where the, all of the humor was about noses. Oh yeah. My initial thoughts were this is boring, and then when I thought about it later, I'm just thinking this really is towing the line of the anti-Semitism it was accused of. They might have gotten away with the, oh, of course it's not anti-Semitic, had it just been that scene. But then not long after that, we have a scene in which Brian uses about five different anti-Semitic slurs in the space of a sentence. Yeah, to deny his Roman heritage. Which comes hot on the heels of a rape joke, and that was kind of the point where I thought, oh, this is how it's going to be. This is how this is going to play out. And I kept looking for, you know, a, a bright spot in it. But all I've really got is, you know, the, the notes that are just full of issues where the humour is coming at the expense of a marginalised group. And I think one of my one of my notes even says, you can tell this was made by a bunch of Oxbridge educated white men in the 70s. Mm. Yeah. That is very much the feel I got from it. And, you know, watching this movie in 2018 as a 
non-Oxbridge educated white woman who has a number of marginalizations. Mm. So it's not specifically poking fun at me, but it's poking fun at people like me. And there's nothing really to find funny about that. Yes, on the point of them being um, white Oxbridge, and from what I can tell in the research, all Christian. It's the sort of movie, and that scene with Brian denying his heritage, it's the sort of thing that you could get away with if you were, say, Mel Brooks. Yeah, it's like if it had been Mel Brooks uttering that line, it would have been hilarious. Or even if he'd just written it, it gives it that context of Jewishness. Yeah, and it's like... It, it... I mean, one thing that was that was actually cut from the movie because even the Pythons themselves thought, uh, no, this is a bit too far, was a character called Otto, who was an extreme Zionist. And the joke of it was that he was a Nazi. So his passionate Zionism and his passion for the purity of Jewishness and the land of Israel, Tonks is, Tonks is making a face with a capital A and a capital F. Oh, it was likened to Nazism with the whole Heil thing and a little Hitler moustache and on a less offensive note a way less funny version of the Suicide Squad joke. It was just not funny but also hugely, hugely, hugely offensive. I'm, I'm sat making a face because you're telling me that in the 70s when, you know, World War II was a lot fresher in everyone's yep. mind, they thought it would be okay to write in film yep. a scene lightning yep. Jewish people to the Nazis. Yep. Like the Holocaust wasn't a goddamn thing. Yep. And consider the Yom Kippur War was in the 70s as well, when the surrounding Arab nations launched an invasion of Israel on Yom Kippur, one of the Jewish holy days. Yeah, this it was cut for a reason. It was cut for a reason, but like what was left in was is almost as bad, you know. And then they compound the anti-Semitism and the brown face with like a heaping dose of transphobia. Um, mm, yeah. In, one of, in like the Colosseum scene, um, the Loretta. And there's two separate characters and two separate sections that feature people with speech impediments. And the second one, it does feature both of them suddenly dropping the impediment and then yeah. and you know talking uh, so it's a put on thing which i actually quite liked but i would have been a lot less uncomfortable if they'd done that gag earlier in the movie instead of five minutes before the end i don't know whether it comes through on the podcast due to expert editing but i stutter so i felt like that mm. was laughing at me and it's i have a fairly mild stutter mm. that doesn't happen all the time for people who have much more severe speech impediments yeah. it's just Again, it's making marginalised folk the butt of the joke. It's punching down. Mm. And that is something good comedy never does. And this whole movie felt like the Pythons were punching downwards. And that, in the end, was what meant I just couldn't find it funny. And unfortunately for them, that some of the scenes that I did kind of like didn't pull a laugh out of me because I've seen them thousands and thousands of times. The biggest dicker section with Pontius Pilate, another yeah. character with a speech impediment. So, so you've got four characters there. You've got biggest dickers and you've got Pontius Pilate and you've got the two jail keepers, all with speech impediments of various forms. And an extended scene mm. towards the end where the cloud is literally taking the f*** out of Pontius Pilate and biggest dickers for their impediments. And I'm sat there just cringing, thinking this isn't f funny you know this is something i deal with this is my life and you're f***ing laughing at me like i'm no i'm not sorry i'm not going to apologize for that because you know this is a film yeah this is a film that is considered a comedy classic and absolutely you know the the group of them went on to inspire a huge number of comedians you know, many of whom i like but i'm not going to apologize for not finding something funny when the joke is at my expense and even when mm -hmm. it's not at my expense, it's at the expense of other people who are marginalised. You can hear, almost hear new middle-aged white men rising up in the comments going, Oh, politically correct, politically correct. And it's like, well, yeah, what I call, what you call being politically correct, I call not being an asshole. And I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I'm going to stop apologising. People being an asshole is never funny. And if you find it funny, you're probably an asshole. I mean, humour is very subjective, but there is... A long, long, long history of humour that punches downwards, a long history of humour at the expense of marginalised people, and a long history of the comedy of the asshole, and the comedy of the anti-PC brigade, so to speak. And it doesn't look like that's going to go away anytime soon. You've got Rick and Morty, and so on. 
The point of Rick and Morty, though, is that you shouldn't want to be Rick. You shouldn't want to be the asshole. But people do. But people do. People will find their heroes where they can. More people should find a hero in Brian, who just wants to get on with his life, who just wants... Well, he just wants to have sex. He just wants, you know, to to be a free Judean man, not oppressed by Romans, but not oppressed by his mum, and with people generally being nice to each other. That's what Brian wants. And he's f***ing crucified for it. There's a lovely accusation. Deal with the accusations that I can hear. Here being levelled, like, screamed across uh, the country. It's not like I don't enjoy comedy. And at the very least, I enjoy Eddie Izzard, who is absolutely and very obviously influenced by the Pythons. Oh yeah, in particular their surrealist style of humour, the uh, the the humour from their TV show. Which, yeah, which everything came out of left field. No, yeah. that's why you get punchlines like things like "There's a pig under the table with a gun," and you know that style of humour was was largely missing from this film. Yeah, uh, barring the scene with the alien, which yeah, it came out of left field, but it didn't fit with the the feel of the movie. So what what you have left is since they're reining back the surrealism, is you just kind of stilted and bland and interspersed with you know these things that i'm supposed to find funny that are you know just them being assholes if it had been a more surreal movie i might have blinked less when the aliens turned up and it might have been funnier it was fantastic to see your face when that happened it just blink 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 what (laughs) yeah i just went and suddenly aliens because that makes sense like, well, know, they had to give Terry Gilliam something to do other than the introduction. You know, they're making a film about first century Judea and telling the story of, of Jesus through through a different lens, and then suddenly there's goddamn aliens because they're... they're I probably shouldn't be blaspheming so much in, in this episode. They're telling the story of Brian, who is, you know, a first century Judean man who is living on the outskirts of what's happening with Jesus and that whole thing. And then suddenly they've got aliens because they've written themselves into a corner and they don't know how to get out again. In fairness, they had the budget for aliens because they reused the sets and costumes and some of the props uh, from a Franco Zeffirelli TV production, Jesus of Nazareth. That was filmed, I think, a year or two before. So they made a little bit of money there. So, hey, aliens. So do you feel that it's not funny because of the style of comedy of the time? Do you think it might be just a 70s thing? I don't think it is just the style of comedy of the time. Because, I mean, it's not like I don't like other classic comedies. Monty Python were notably absent from what I enjoyed, despite my dad being a fan. But there are other comedies from the 70s and the 80s, things like you two Ronnie's. Ronnie's Twain. There's an entire box set of Open All Hours over there. And then going on to things like Allo, Allo, and Are You Being Served? And even some of the Carry On films I've seen and enjoyed. So it's not I'm a modern comedy fan looking at it and going, oh, this is old. Those other things have their issues. That They all have instances of, you know, they're punching down a bit, problematic portrayals. But Life of Brian kind of just felt like this was concentrated offensive. TM. Whereas a lot of other comedy I liked from the era wasn't. But then a lot of the comedy I liked from the era is very much the, the double entendre stuff. Mm, um, yeah. The the wordplay kind of comedy rather than whatever it is Monty Python are meant to be doing. Especially the two Ronnies. I know you're really, really big on the surprise punchline, the reworded punchline. So, you know, it definitely isn't the case that I've kind of just swept all comedy that was made before 1995 under the rug and I'm just ignoring it as archaic. There's something about Python and this film in particular that just really rubs me up the wrong way. Couple of fun facts. Uh, While Tonks bars up the windows and doors to keep the angry mob out, there was a small schism in, in the Pythons as to whether the film was heretical or not. Terry Jones and Eric Idle were saying it's heretical, uh, not blasphemous. Whereas John Cleese was saying it wasn't heresy at all. It was just satire and satire is fine. I would say it's pretty heretical. In the biggest dickest scene, uh, which Tonks didn't find risible, the extras were specifically told that if they laugh, they'll get fired. I think one of the guards in the scene is Neil Innes of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, but the other guys uh, were all extras, and anyone who laughed before the appointed punchline laugh right at the end, sacked. Uh, The scene where Brian addresses the crowd, when he first opens the window, you can see Graham Chapman's penis. Oh yes, the full frontal nudity that I was not expecting. Was anyone? He's just pootling along going, is 
that this film is kind of offensive and boring and suddenly dead. I will tell you who else wasn't expecting it. Several women in the crowd weren't told that he was going to be naked. I don't think the crowd must have been told at all, I suppose. But yeah, the Muslim women in the, in the crowd shrieked and ran away, apparently. Which, to be honest, I'd have the same reaction as well. But after that scene was shot, uh, Terry Jones um, took Graham Chapman aside and said, Graham, I think we can see you're not Jewish. Because obviously, Brian would have been circumcised. Graham Chapman, not circumcised. So they fixed that uh, with a couple of rubber bands. And apparently, if you rewind and linger lovingly over the shots of his penis, um, you can see that. You can see that uh, there has been a rushed circumcision job on him. That seems deeply unpleasant, and I don't even have a penis. Okay, so I think Tonks has managed to angry mob-proof the rest of the house. So yeah, so you had a few thoughts on the political shenanigans yes. that Brian gets himself sucked into before he ends up as a quasi-messiah. Yes, I did find it very funny um, when he joins the protest group, the People's Front of Judea, and then there's all the talk of the this, this, this splitting, this little groups, uh, the Judean People's Front and the Judean Popular People's Front, uh, the popular front, campaign for free Galilee, and so on and so forth. I lived for a very short time in Palestine, um, and one thing that was notable to me was all the little groups there were fighting the occupation, but also seemingly fighting each other. And you had, again, the popular front and you know the People's Liberation Party and all that sort of stuff. It was amusing to me you know, to see the splitters. Splitters! Because that's that's how it seemed to be. And it seemed to me that they were riffing directly off that. In the 70s, that was when a lot of those groups were, you know, most notably active. Yeah, uh, the PLO in particular. I think they were the forerunners. So, Hollywood always rebooting everything, as we discussed in the last episode. Would you be interested in a reboot of Life of Brian? No. <laughs> if they were to reboot it, is there anybody you think would be able to do it justice? What would you want or what would you do for a Life of Brian remake? I don't think one's necessary, and I certainly don't think would be interested in a reboot. But if they were to remake it, reboot it, one thing that this film desperately needed at all levels of involvement were some non-white people. So yeah, okay, you know, mm. some more, more, more involvement from Christians. But you're telling a story about Jewish people in the first century. It's like, involve some Jewish people in, yeah. you know, both the in writing and behind the scenes and, and acting as well. I mean, the clues in the name of the place where they live, Judea. If you were to do... I mean, this goes for telling any kind of similar story. You in, you involve the people that you're telling the story about. Why is this hard? This is a no-brainer. So yeah, no, I don't think that a reboot or a remake is necessary. If they were, they'd certainly have to update the humour a little bit. You start by involving the people that you're telling the story about, and in that way you can try and make it as not horribly racist and anti-Semitic as you possibly can. And no, that wouldn't take away from the humour. With regard to reboots uh, and remakes, um, I don't think one would be coming. I think it's considered iconic. I don't think anyone can do Python without Pythons. Um, so, no reboot necessary. Is there anything that can follow in its footsteps? Already has been. Dogma. Kevin Smith's Dogma. They've got the same basic message of faith without an organised structure. Or without necessarily an organised structure. Because you don't need followers, you don't need to be a follower of the gourd, you don't need to be a follower of the sandal. You just need to be a good person, you just need to think for yourself, and you just need to f*** off. How shall we f*** off? I don't know, just f*** off! Please don't unsubscribe. Please. I know we're a bit controversial with this one. I know that they're a beloved institution of the Pythons, uh, and I know that there's going to be a lot of people in the comments... Uh, who are going to be a little upset. And I can appreciate that, I understand. It's never it's never easy to have someone go, You like that? Yeah. Well, it's crap. But it's okay. Humor's subjective. We still love you. Please still love us. I went into this hoping I'd like it, and I was sat watching it thinking, I was really hoping to save the controversial stuff for like later in, in, in the podcast run. Like, nope. Instead, no, second episode. So how are we going to rate this one? Uh, I believe in the previous podcast that we f***ed <laughs> up, it was gourds or, or, or sandals? One gourd or sandal out of five? Give them a C for effort? They tried. They certainly made a film. Of course, the big question is, is it one sandal or is it one gourd? Yes. Splitter!
I would give it... I mean, I still thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know how much of that is because I've seen it so many times. A lot of the jokes are like old friends. Even the ones that make me go... I would probably give it three and a half gourds uh, out of five. Uh, simply because while I still enjoy the movie, I myself have changed from the person that I was when I last saw the movie. And I think... Yep. I don't think... I don't know if you can hear the crashing... Um, but that is the angry mob. They made it through the living room window. Are you okay, Tonks? <laughs> that was the angry mob. Jay, Jay, put down that torch. Leave that pitchfork alone. Okay, guys, I think it's time to wrap this up. I'm Sam. I've been Tonks. And that's still Jay in the corner with the pitchfork. We are celluloid scrutiny. We'll see you next time if we're still alive. Roll the outro! Episodes and transcripts of Celluloid Scrutiny, as well as more information on your hosts, can be found at celluloidscrutiny.co.uk and on Twitter at celluloidcast. Links to Tonks' novels can be found at racheltonkshill.com and she is on Twitter at Captain Raz. Sam's films, as well as subtitled versions of the podcast, are on the YouTube channel Splendiferous Productions, and he is on Twitter at Splend. And now the shipping forecast issued by your hosts, Pontius Pilot and Biggest Dickus. Also, Tonks, and not watching this movie.